good to see all of you this morning. Good to be here in the house of the Lord today and to have the opportunity to worship together. And uh, uh, though we're not singing the songs of Zion uh, out loud, we have some of them being played. And uh, we're not doing a lot of music in this Christmas season, at least in the church. I would encourage you to sing to your heart's desire anywhere else. Uh, and even outside, but uh, if anyone would want to do something for next Sunday or any Sunday as far as that goes to bring a message and song or instrument, you're more than welcome to do so, and uh, I'll give you the stage and give you plenty of space up here. So uh, it's not that we don't have lack for opportunity, it's just uh, you're going to be on your own. <laughs> I'll play for you if you want me to play for you, if I can play it, but... Um, as soon as I get my guitar fixed, I've been at, trying to get it fixed for weeks, and someone loaned me one. Actually, months I've been trying to get it fixed, and then someone loaned me one here at the church. Mrs. Bailey did, and I'm thankful for that. And it just didn't quite work out, uh, and so I'm trying to get mine. Uh, I got to get it fixed now. It's not that I don't know how to tune it, string it, maybe even play it a little bit. But anyway. Uh, any of the rest of you that want to do something that's totally up to you, just because I don't want music taking over the church, which it seems like it has in many churches, it doesn't mean that I don't want music in the church. Let's just get that straight, okay? Good, good music for the Lord's glory. Now, I just want to throw that out there free of charge. And uh, as far as uh, prayers go, yes, let's keep all these people in our prayers, one another in our prayers. and. Though we don't always agree with our leaders, let's still, the Bible tells us to keep them in our prayers as a part of our obedience to the, to the offices that God ordained for their responsibilities to look out as shepherds for the people, whether good shepherds, bad shepherds or not, to pray for them, to have a peaceful spirit about ourselves. And with that in mind, we'll go ahead and ask the teacher and their students to be dismissed for class this morning. Good to have all of you with us. each and every one of you. I'm going to ask that you turn uh, to the book of Revelation this morning as we continue in our series, Heaven 2.0. Heaven 2.0. I entitle this lesson, God's Curse, God's Care. Excuse me, God's Cure. God's Curse, God's Cure. We know that God has cursed this earth because of sin, not because he doesn't like people, but because of sin. The environment that Adam and Eve was on was pristine, uh, perfect, but uh, uh, because of the curse, the, th the thorns and the thistles and the briars and the bugs and such came along and things uh, made it difficult for mankind to live in a place where mankind was actually the blame for the fall of mankind and uh, and also for the curse upon the earth. And both have been groaning, as Romans chapter 8 teaches us. The earth groans, people groan, a whole lot of groaning going on. But God's going to re is the Redeemer. He redeems the souls of mankind, but He's also going to redeem the creation as well one of these days. If you could tell from your questions in the bulletin, there's a whole lot about the second coming. That's mentioned twice there and some other things as well. And our questions for the 11 a.m. service, which we try to get going no later than 11.15, which we almost succeeded in doing this morning. This is basics number 400, heaven lesson 5, God's curse, God's cure. Revelation 21 and verse 1, John says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. We've been talking several weeks now on heaven being a real place. And heaven offered to those who will have Christ as their Savior as a real promise. 
And we'll look at some other aspects of this in the next couple of weeks. But I entitled this lesson, God's Curse, God's Cure. Because God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth, and the old one is going to pass away. What I posted this morning to the group is that we... We have coming in our future things that have not yet been seen that we all are to take by faith just like we do the promise of salvation. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And we take that by faith and we give that as an invitation to people to know the Lord. And we take that as a part of the Scripture by faith, that we literally believe that we're born again when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior. We're not figuratively getting saved. We are literally, actually getting saved. September the 6th, 1975, I literally married Vicki Lee Smith of Fincastle, Virginia. I literally married her. And we've been married for 45 literal years. Now, it don't work out that way for everybody, but I'm just giving my testimony. But we've been literally married. I was literally married to her. I wasn't figuratively married to her. She wasn't a Russian bride that I met online and I just had a virtual relationship with her. We literally got married on September the 6th 1975. You know, make sure you get that right, man. <laughs> Whether it would have ended in 1976 or not, we want to make sure we get that date right and we're referencing that. But anyway, we were literally married. We weren't figuratively married. And so there's things that are supposedly, and then there are things that are reality. Well, that was a reality, and we're living the dream yet today. As I say with my tongue still inside my cheek, because it is so true. But as you go forward, there are things that are literal and there are things that are figurative. And so we believe that heaven is literal, that it is real. And so there has to be something said about the way you interpret the Bible. When we started our study years ago in the book of Revelation... And we finished it years ago, which I don't know if I'll ever teach the whole thing all over again. But the first lesson was on how we are, according to Scripture, to interpret the Bible. The Bible teaches us how to interpret the Bible. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here little, there little. Learning the concepts and the precepts of the Bible. Taking it to memory, taking it to heart, and then putting it into practice. And then living with an expectation like he expected the Jews to do for thousands of years. And the people since the, since the very first people were on the face of the earth in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, after Adam and Eve had sinned, God said to the woman, he said, there's going to be a woman that's going to bring forth God's son who's going to redeem mankind. He's going to crush Satan and he's going to lift mankind up or at least offer to lift mankind up. But first, as Jesus teaches us in the book of John, Jesus himself first would have to be lifted up on Calvary for that to be made possible. And we look at that as a reality. In faith, we look at that as a reality. So there's the physical world, there's the empirical world. There's the ra- the empirical world is more the physical world, and then there's the rational, the way you think about things, your brain energy. I know we're all squinting some because of, of reasons that we don't need to go over, keep going over, but we're trying to think things out as we try to experience feels, feelings of things, how they feel, and we try to repeat things like my wife. She made. A, 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 a chess pile last night, and it, it was great. I mean, it, it is great. And I empirically experienced that pie. I have experienced some that weren't so good. Of course, not made by her, of course. 
empirical experience. That's what so many base their joy of life on is empirical experience. Touch, feel, taste, smell, see, hear. And then we come to reason why we like certain things, different ways, different colors, different sounds of music, because we, we, it, it still goes to the soul, the you. And then there's the rationalism, the ability to rationalize, to, to figure out and to use different ways of, of, uh, uh, deducting and inducting in our study and our things and thoughts and reasoning why. And that really goes into full gear. And so, you know, the, you get those people who are just live in that, um, cerebral world who are kind of like, uh, uh, people like Sheldon on the Big Bang. You know, I don't follow that, but I've watched it enough to know how his cerebral thinking is. Everything is numbers and chemicals and such and rationalizations. And of course, that's the extreme, but I'm just saying. And then you've got those who have become saved and are dealing in the spiritual realm. Now, it doesn't mean people in the rational realm and the physical realm don't have connotations of trying to understand spiritual things, but in the Child of God, once you are born again, God starts dealing directly with your spirit. His spirit is bearing witness with your spirit. And trying to help you understand the things that you don't see doesn't mean that they're not real and that they should not become something that you should expect. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this is why I want us to understand heaven is a real place. It's not just a real physical place. It's a, it's, it's a real place and it's wonderful. And we go by faith that it is there and that we accept it as real. And so I want to give a little rundown of some things that are coming. If any of you want want me to send you a copy of these notes, I will be glad to do it. Anybody, just give me your email and say, uh, Pastor John, would you send me a copy of those notes from Sunday because I could not keep up with you. You went into, as truck drivers say, Georgia Overdrive on this one. You had a full load, you popped it in, and you was getting all you could out of it. That's what we called it anyway when I was in the service. A full load, you're just running it on, and you're just keeping your air brakes up, hoping that you wouldn't have to run up a gravel pile somewhere. Because it was old, it was redlining on the gears. You couldn't get no higher. You could tacked out, you couldn't go no harder, couldn't go no higher, and you had a full, you had a full load, and now it's pushing you. Anyway, before the new heaven and the new earth of Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1 1 is going to be revealed, you will note from Revelation 19, so I ask you to back up to Revelation 19 verse 11 through 14, and something that is going to happen before... There are several things that are going to happen, and there's a time period, and I'm going to try to take you through a little bit of that this morning. Because God has a cure for the curse that has come upon mankind. Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were, were like. Now, it's important for us to understand about the Bible. Please understand this when it comes to understanding the Bible. The Bible uses parts of speech just like any other kind of literature. Though the Bible is inspired, we must understand that the time that John wrote the book of Revelation, he saw things that did not exist 2,000 years ago. And thus, a part of speech called a simile is where you see comparisons of something to something else and you use key words to help you understand when a simile is being used. So this is something that is literally going to be or something John literally saw, but he had nothing at the time in his life or human history to compare it to, like airplanes and bullets and bombs and things of that nature and Internet and stuff like that. They had no concept of that. And so you'd see words, and the word like, as, or like, as unto, 
or as unto, these tell you that a simile, or as used as a simile, that something similar to what he saw is going to happen. When the simile is not used, it is to be taken as literally what he says it is to be. And this is how we literally study the Word of God. Yes, there are, there are parables in the Bible. There are other parts of speech or other expressions in the Bible. There is hyperbole used in the Bible. In other words, people who use extreme language, they didn't really mean it, but they used extreme language to get a point across. Like Jesus says, it's better for a man to have his hands cut off or his eyes poked out than not to get into heaven. Jesus didn't advocate people gouging their eyes out and cutting their hands off. He was using hyperbole as an expression to show how bad hell is. It's important when you're having the Bible taught to you that the people who are teaching understand parts of speech and the languages from which these Books of the Bible come from. That's what your pastor is supposed to do. In other words, when a mom or dad, whichever the case may be, fixes pancakes, just because it looks like powder doesn't mean it's a pancake mix. He may have concrete mix there, or dope, or some other kind of white powder, but When you're the person who's the cook in the kitchen, or in that case, I guess, a baker or whatever, you got to know the contents that you're making, what you're going to serve. It can't just look like white powder that you make pancakes out of. It's got to be pancake mix. Or Martha White self-rising flour. Whatever you want to use, it's not going to turn out the same as a pancake mix. But what I'm trying to say is that when you're presenting the Word of God, you need to know what's in the mix, not just something that looks like it. There are too many people listen to people right now on the Internet in places who have got current, current issues, and that's all they've got to talk about is current issues and not the Scripture. I want us to understand something that's important that we understand the Bible, the Bible literally, that there has to be a, a, sometimes of some explanations. Anyway, I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were light. His eyes weren't a flame of fire. They were like something like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. And the armies that were in heaven followed after him upon, not like. There's no simile used here. I want you to understand that. That's why I've been wearing my rodeo shirts lately to church. I'm trying to get ready for the, for the uh, second coming. The rapture is first in the seven-year tribulation period, and then there's, there's a return on a horse. So I'm, I'm getting my Western wear ready, getting used to it. So that's the reason why. There's a reason for everything. It's prophecy. Anyway, and the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Heavenly Father, we ask you to help us to understand the importance of your word. And while we're here today, help us to understand the truth that is in your word and help me as a pastor and a communicator to put it out there in such a way that it can be understandable and edifying. And we ask for people to have faith in the truth. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So that passage in Revelation 19, 11 through 14 is what we know as the second coming of Jesus Christ. Coming with armies of angels, holy angels that is, and resurrected saints of which the believer is attired, as seen here, in fine linen, white and clean. And that signified that you have already been to the beam of seat judgment of Christ, where your works were tried for reward. This is not a, did you get in or did you not make it, uh, trial. You wouldn't be there if you weren't in. There are different judgments in the Scripture for different time periods and different groups of people, the saved and the unsaved. 
For the unsaved, there's one judgment. It's at the end of time, all time. And then there's the judgment of believers for rewards for works. I mean, rewards for the works that you have lived out in your life. And for the time you've exercised faith when you, you really didn't know whether you could or should or not, but you did anyway. For you becoming the person that God wants you to be. No one has ever become all that God wants them to be as a Christian, but you become more than you were. Okay? And you are still in Christ if you receive Christ as your Savior. You're still in Him. Never forget that. Please, never forget that. But this wearing of the white robes demonstrates, or white and clean, the linen, that's their robes, is a symbol that you have not only gone through the judgment seat of the Lord for rewards, but you've also been decorated for your service unto God, and you are shown to have been totally purified. And that's for every believer. Okay? This is the second coming of our Lord. This takes place at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. So you have the rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation period, the second coming of Christ, and then the setting up of the thousand-year reign of Christ upon the earth. Now, I've got a prophecy chart that has all this on it if somebody wants it. But let me just go back to this. I'm going to do this lesson backwards. So there's the new heaven and the new earth, okay? That's Revelation 21 and verse 1. So let's get to where that came to be, where there was going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Chapter 19, verses 11 through 14 is the second coming of Christ. He's coming back to the earth. He's bringing the holy angels and the saints with him, okay? The believers with him. The word saint is the Greek word hagios, and it means those who have been separated. When you receive Jesus Christ, God separated you unto him. That's where we get the word saint from, okay? Not something that the Catholic Church has baked up, but it is a scriptural term denoting those from the Greek word hagios who have been separated, and you've been separated unto God. You may not be well known, you may not be some great personality in the things of God, but you are a saint. On to, as far as God's turn, and it has to do with your position in the body of Christ. Not some great miracle or some great work that you have done. The second coming of our Lord takes place at the end of the seven year tribulation period, which is prophesied to happen to the nation Israel and is prophesied to bring Israel to her knees. This second coming of our Lord follows the rapture of the church that had happened seven years earlier. And the rapture of the church, should it happen right now, your whole body, your outfit, whatever you got on, shoes, watch, all is going with you. The whole nine yards is going with you. Your mask too. Maybe he'll kick that off. Because you won't have to worry about disease anymore. But the rapture of the church is actually the, the word raptus from the Latin means to snatch up or snatch away. And the body, it is the bodily snatching up or taking up of all living New Testament believers. And at the same time, the New Testament believers whose bodies are in the ground will also be raised up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 54. Their body will also be changed in a moment in a twinkling eye and you'll be snatched up together to be with the Lord. But the body and all goes out. The graves will be emptied. You sitting in this church pew, it will be emptied. If the rapture was to happen right now and you look around and all of a sudden there's nobody here but you, you got a problem. Or I've got a problem. Could be me too, if I'm not saved. But Jesus Christ will descend from heaven when he comes back, which means heaven is a literal place. It's beyond the solar system, which is the second heavens, and it's beyond the first heavens, which is our atmosphere about above us. But he will descend out of a place. Heaven is a place. 
Jesus Christ will, at that time, in the second coming, in the rapture, he just comes and snatches us out. And for seven years, we're up there while all hell is breaking loose down here. We'll look, talk about that in a few minutes. So you've got, you've got two groups of people. You've got those that will be pulled up into heaven when the rapture happens. You've got those that will be left on the earth during the tribulation period. And then you have the next section, which is people who will be in the millennial reign of Christ for that next thousand years. All this involves God dealing with mankind on earth. Jesus will, when he comes in his second coming at the end of the seven year tribulation period, he will come to, to establish his kingdom on the earth. But first, before he establishes his kingdom, he is going to make war upon the beast of the book of Revelation, who is in Revelation 13 known as the Antichrist, a false teacher or professor who claims to be the Son of God. Now, the Antichrist is an evil man who is going to broker a false peace alliance between Israel and the Arab states in the first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period after the rapture of the church. He's an evil man. He is going to broker a false peace alliance between Israel and the Arab states. While simultaneously, he is also at that same time going to be making an alliance with ten nations of which he will rise to the cream of the top or the cream of the, of the, of the jar. He's going to be the head honcho of a ten nation confederation. He's going to be El Presidente or ruler or dictator or whatever of what ten nations I'm not sure, but the Bible says there will be ten nations and he will be the ruler supreme of those ten nations. He will do this in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. He'll make a false peace effort. There will be peace. He will be lifted up as being a man who's a visionary, who understands the economic, the political, and the religious landscape of the world. And he has great communication skills, so much so that he will deceive, the Bible says, even the very people of God who are here. And there will be people of Israel who are returning to Christ very quickly after the rapture of the church, and those are the ones to whom uh, John refers. The first witnesses to the world of the gospel of Christ during the tribulation period will be the 144,000 Jews that God in His providence has sealed that will be saved in the beginning months of the tribulation period. And there will be people who will be left behind who had not rejected the gospel who will have an opportunity to be saved during the seven-year tribulation period. Those who have rejected the gospel will believe the lies of the Antichrist and be damned, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They'll believe the lie. There are people nowadays that believe every lie that comes down the pipe. But God will give them over to that delusion that day because they have pushed God's button too far and there is no mercy left for them. And so they'll be as henchmen. They'll be the people spying on their neighbors all the time. They'll be people just like that. You better fall in line with the Antichrist. If you're not, I'm going to turn you in and go get you in trouble and you won't be able to buy or sell unless you get his mark on your forehead or in your hand. That This stuff could happen any time. You know, there's nothing to say that there's not going to be a trial run before the real before the rapture takes place. I, I want us to understand that there will be birth pangs before the second coming of Christ, the Bible says. Like a mother that is about ready to give child birth to her child, but she hasn't delivered it yet. There will be birth pangs that will happen on the world scene before the rapture takes place. But when the rapture takes place, the things then from Revelation 3 on deal with the tribulation period and then the eternal state. And so understand when you study the book of Revelation, once you get past chapter 3, you're going to be dealing with things that are you're not going to be here to see. But when you get to chapter 19, you'll see that you're coming back with the Lord because you're up there. He's judging you for your works for reward. He's decorating you and preparing you for his service, for his kingdom age, and then you've got all eternity that follows after that, where there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Nobody is standing out there ready to push a red button to end it all. That's not going to happen. God's got the only one that's got a handle on the red button. So don't let some fool tell you that a man can end it all, because a man can't do it. 
Don't let anybody tell you that. They've just been duped. And they're, they're, they're not listening to the Word of God. Jesus is going to get His kingdom established on the earth. He's going to fulfill the covenants that the Father made with Abraham. The father of the Jewish people. And those promises will be fulfilled, as I've said many times before. But the Antichrist is a very evil man. But he's a smooth talker. You imagine how it was that Hitler became so influential among the German people that he got the whole country turned onto his side, though there were alliances that were along the side of him. They got all the world turned mad after that man. And look what the madness that he created. You'd think, well, how is it that so many people were duped by one little little man? Just a corporal in World War I. How is it this little fellow was so influential? Because people who can be speakers, who are held to a high level of accountability to God, much less to mankind, have given, been given gifts. Some people use them for good. Some people use them for bad. You know, when you have an orator, a person who just does good at public speaking and has a lot of good things to say and has an analytical mind that can just reminisce and bring up thoughts out of their mind without fear and without too many slip-ups, uh, is an orator. They have a gift. Well, evil people can have a gift too, okay, of communication. It's amazing how many things God has given wonderful to mankind, humankind, men and women, that they have used for bad reasons. A good-looking woman shouldn't use her looks for bad reasons. A good-looking man shouldn't use his looks for bad reasons. If you're talented, you shouldn't use your talents for bad reasons. That's an abuse of a gift. That beautiful skin, that beautiful complexion, all that, then you look like shoe leather. (laughs) <laughs> one day, you think, what in the world happened to him or her? Too much sun tanning <laughs> and whatever. But anyway, the evil Antichrist abuses the gifts that he has as a human being and uses them against God's people. But this guy goes so far as that he ends up being possessed by the devil himself in the middle of the tribulation period of the seven year tribulation period. And the second three and a half years of that seven year period of sorrow upon the world, specifically ordained by God that it would bring the Jews back to a sense of their love and God's love for them. There will be havoc reaped upon the entire world beginning in Jerusalem. And there the Antichrist will break his covenant with Israel and he will also proclaim himself as being himself The Son of God. He will have His image put into the temple itself. Demonstrating to the world that He has all power. Or faux power. He will have a massive army of ten nations. And along with these three other international powerhouses, which I will mention, which are going to be China, Russia, and a pan-Arab alliance. Because there's going to be three other world powers during the tribulation period. China is going to be a world power. Russia is going to be a world power. And so are the Pan-Arab alliances. And the fourth power will be the Antichrist with his ten-nation confederation of power. And these wicked forces will all gather with plans to utterly wipe nation, the nation Israel from off the face of the earth. And we ask ourselves, well, why is Israel such a target all the time? Because Israel is... The motherland of Jesus, who was a Jew. And Satan despises the Jewish people. And especially the tribe of Judah from whence Jesus came. From whence King David came. The Antichrist, international powers, will be comprised of joint military forces aided by joint political and economic forces, and they will at that time come together to make war against Israel, to utterly destroy her from off the face of the earth. And then all of a sudden, their attention is going to be turned to something strange and fearful coming out of the upper atmosphere. It will be Jesus Christ. As Revelation 19, 11 through 14 tells us, he will be sitting upon a white horse coming out of the heavenlies with a holy army of saints and angels coming to judge the inhabitants of the earth. 
This is literal interpretation of the Bible. It's not figurative speech. This stuff wasn't put in the Bible just to fulfill some sort of someone's fantasy or anything. It's going to happen. And when that happens, the Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 19. We read verses 11 through 14. Let me continue up to verse 20. And so the armies that were in heaven followed with him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. These are New Testament believers and holy angels who have been resurrected and are with the Lord. And out of his mouth, that is out of our Lord's mouth, goeth a sharp sword, speaking judgment, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That's his prophecy of his coming kingdom, which is about to commence at that time. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He's bringing severe judgment upon the earth. And he that, hath on, he that has on his vesture and on his thigh, these are his chaps, he's riding a horse, you know, one side says King of Kings, and the other side has it written on it, Lord of Lords. And you're riding with him. He's not riding against you. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, and saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God. He's calling in all the raptors, birds, hawks, buzzards, vultures. There's going to be bodies everywhere. See, we're not worried about so much about COVID taking over the world. Jesus Christ is coming back to claim it. Ezekiel 39, 12. Don't turn there with me if you would. You may have never heard this passage or read it before. Ezekiel, if you go back to Isaiah, after the book of Psalms and Proverbs, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, you get to Isaiah. Then you get to Jeremiah, then you get to Lamentations, and then you get to Ezekiel, then you get to Daniel, because we just went through Lamentations. Ezekiel 39, if you would, please. No. See, we don't have to imagine this stuff and just fantasize like we were watching some sort of a Marvel Comics movie or something here is, and I imagine they've probably gotten some of their ideas from the book of Revelation. I'm pretty sure a lot of artists have, well, especially a lot of tattoo artists have. <laughs> I'm not saying anything against it. I'm just saying a lot of the ideas come up. It's not my place, I guess. Doesn't bother me. I used to draw on myself all the time, but it'd come off. <laughs> you know what's the worst kind, though? You know what the worst kind of tattoo is? It's the kind where you write your girlfriend on your neck and she breaks up with you. Right there on the juggler. Right there. Or cut it on a carded artery right here. Put your boyfriend's name right there, and then he breaks up with you. And then for your life, you can't get that thing. Pull a Tyson and get all this done right here. Look like a poinsettia on your face, you know. You put all the names of all the people that you love who've turned on you, then you, you know, you, you can't get it off. Not enough makeup to cover that. This is stuff is real. According to the lots and lots of 40 years of studying this subject. Because there's going to be a powerhouse of China, 200 million coming across towards Israel. 200 million, the Bible says. Russia is going to come down. That's Gog and Magog, the prince and then the nation itself. And they're going to make an alliance with Syria. We've taught that before. And they're going to come two different ways, through the Mediterranean, down through the Bosporus Pass, out of the country, into the Mediterranean, and one's going to come down through Syria and come in down from the north. And they're going to make a two-pronged attack, and God's going to do it. He's going to, in, in, he is going, God is going to entice the leader of Russia to do this because he wants to get all of them in one place so he can wipe them out in one big punch. And he does before they ever even hit, 
hit the land of Israel, he's going to knock them out in one big punch. Doesn't say how, but he's going to do it. He wants to pull them together. He says, it's like I'm going to put a hook in your jaw and draw you in. I'll sock it to you right there. I've got all of the, you know, it's like, it's like if you want to get rid of a lot of flies, you put a fly trap up. Or you put something, you want to get rid of a bunch of ants. Or I know you've never seen to get rid of all of them, but you put a little sugar pile there and then they all get there, got them. That's what God's going to do to Russia. China, he's going to take care of China. And then the Pan-Arab alliances, they're going to be from the southern group that are trying to come up and we're going to scare the, uh, the bejeebas out of them. God is. And we're going to be with him. You're going to be in this war. You are in Armageddon. You say, I can't ride. <laughs> you better start practicing it. Well, no, it might not be a horse. It might be a maybe a hundred horsepower or something. I don't know. Or two hundred. I don't know. I'm just saying you're coming back with him. Whatever part you have, it may it might not be that part, but whatever you're coming back with. I'm coming back with him as a believer in Christ. But Revelation uh, Ezekiel thirty nine. There was a prophecy against Gog, which is Russia. Uh, I went through this years ago, explained the etymology of the word for Russia, but it's Gog, and the things that connote who it is. But um, that passage that I had there uh, for this is uh, Ezekiel 39, 12 through 17. It says, uh, verse 11, And it will come to pass at that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel. These are Russians. The valley of the travelers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the travelers. Why? Because the stench is going to be so bad from all the death. And there shall be, they bury the Russians and all their multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them. This is the follow up of the burial detail following the second coming of Jesus Christ that they are burying them, that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to their renown on the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall set apart men for the continual task of passing through the land to bury with the help of the travelers. That's not the insurance company. Those that remain upon the face of the land to cleanse it after the end of the seven months shall they make search. And the travelers that pass through the land when they seeth a man's bones shall set it up of sign by it till the burials have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. And also the name of the city shall be Hamanoth. Thus shall they cleanse the land. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl, to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come to gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink the blood. And it just, just goes on. But I wanted to bring, I wanted to bring that out. And that passage right there. And so they were buried, verse 18, both small and great. And I saw the beast. I saw the beast. And the kings of the earth. And their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and his army. That's the Antichrist. They were at one time looking to take on Israel. And Jesus comes back as their Redeemer and Savior to redeem them. And they had turned their attention away from Israel to the heavenlies. And the beast was taken with him and the false prophet. That is someone who uh, lifts up the Antichrist. Uh, this is his PR man, the false prophet is. And the Antichrist was taken and his PR man that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived the people that had received the mark of the beast or the Antichrist because they're convinced that the leader has great powers above human beings, but it's a demonic power. 
He deceived them that received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image, as Second Thessalonians 2 says he would. These both were cast alive. So you don't die when you go to hell. You're alive when you're in hell. These both were cast. The Greek word there is ekbalo, and it means to get the boot kicked off. They were cast alive into not a lake. The Greek has a definite article here, the lake, a specific lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. That's the Ezekiel 39, 12 through 17 passage of the seven plus months of finding and burying the dead. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeds out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh, as Ezekiel also says. Now, do you believe the Bible literally? There are too many people who do not believe in the literal interpretation of the Scripture. It's just a fable to them. Well, I want to here to tell you that the things that the Bible says that would have happened and have happened that were prophesied centuries or thousands of years before it happened, happened. And just as that happened, as the coming of Christ in His first advent and the things that happened did happen that said that were going to happen, so are the things that have not yet happened that were, are said to be hap- that will happen. They will happen as well. And I don't know why people are so slow to get it. You just can't shake dumb out of people. You can't shake unbelief out of people. They have to have it for themselves. And God bless them, you just can't do anything for them. But just try to live the life for the Lord. Don't feel bad if you can't get your family to see things from the Word of God. People in the Lord's day, even when standing side by side with them, had a problem with it. Can you imagine worshiping idols after you crossed the Red Sea with Moses and the water is lifted back and the fish looking there at you? You looking back at the fish as you're going through with your family and your possessions on dry land? Can you imagine the walls like this and you're going through and you get over on the other side you don't even have to shake the water off of your cloak. And then turning back around and thanking God for it and seeing, oh no, here comes the enemy, here comes the enemy. Oh no, they're coming through the ocean. Here comes the Pharaoh and his armies and his horses and his spears and his chariots and their arrows are coming to kill. Oh, they're going to kill us all. We're so small and so helpless and they're so big and powerful and all of a sudden, whoosh! They're gone forever. That's the God that we believe in. That's the God that we accept by faith as being true. But can you imagine that within months of those same people crossing the Red Sea, they were going around worshiping a a golden calf and fornicating around at the base of it. Because that was the idol worship that they had been a part of back in Egypt. So what I'm saying is that we're only here by the grace of God. We're not judges. It's only by the mercy of God that we have anything, live and move and have our being. But getting back, as we're going to close up here, these armies are about to take on Israel to destroy her off the face of the earth. We know that's where she's headed from other scripture. And they turn their attention back to the heavens. Hmm. There's a strange and fearful event coming out of the upper atmosphere. It'll be Jesus Christ sitting upon a white horse coming out of the heaven with the holy angels, saints, to judge the inhabitants of the earth. The Antichrist and the false prophet are cast alive into the lake of fire. Also another real place. It's not a figurative or imaginary place just to scare the bejeebers out of people from doing bad stuff. It's a real place. The Bible says it's a real place. So it's a real place. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, verse 19, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That's important to understand that because it's also important if you look at Revelation 20 and verse 10 
that about a thousand years after the beast and the false prophet are put in hell, at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, a thousand year glorious reign of Christ upon the earth, at that time, the devil that deceived the people, because he's let out of the bottomless pit for a short period to let people's true beliefs be known. That's a thousand years later, take mind you. But then the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. They don't die. They're put into hell and they continue in that special place that they're put. And I note that a thousand years after this Antichrist, who is a human being who sold out to the devil... And the false prophet likewise, his PR man, who also was possessed by demons, though not born that way, he let his heart become wicked and conditioned to become that way, as did the Antichrist or the beast, as he's called. They're in this lake of fire for a thousand years, and they're still alive. Their existence is not annihilated because they're in this place of torment. It is perpetuated. Your life is not annihilated if you're an unbeliever when you die. It is perpetuated. Lord, if you could just get people to understand it. But people are so dumb and so dim-witted. They just can't get it. They're so dull of mind and heart. You can't. You, I, I get frustrated and, I, and at the same time I feel sad for them. Jesus Christ would then take His vengeance upon the lost world. Revelation 19 and verse 21. The remnant were then slain. This is after he puts the Antichrist and the false prophet into hell. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon their horse, which sword proceeds out of his mouth. And all the fowls filled with their flesh, as we read in Revelation chapter uh, Ezekiel 39, verses 12 through 17. So the unsaved, Jesus Christ will speak, if not destroy them, and they will die. Those who have believed on the Lord during the tribulation, seven year tribulation period, will have opportunity then to go into the kingdom age. Whether you're in the land of, of Jerusalem or you're in America or somewhere else on the planet. If we're still a nation, they will still be a nation. We may not be. There are, and believers will be the only people alive after this judgment is over with. Everybody will be a believer, whether you're a Jew who has received your Messiah or you got saved during the tribulation period. Now, the, many of those will be martyrs for the faith during that time. Many, probably hundreds of thousands, if not more, during that time. But if you're still alive, you're going to go into the millennial kingdom. Now, if you're a believer and you've rejected the gospel in this day and age, you're going, you're not going to be among that number because you're going to be among those who receive the mark of the beast because you believe there's lies. And you were duped by it. No, do, no good to build a bunker up in the mountain somewhere or a hideout in a cave somewhere because the Spirit of God can, doesn't, you never get lost from God. That's why it's so foolish that the unsaved like to do their, as John chapter 3 and verse 19 says, they like to do their work in the dark and evil as if God can't see them in the dark. Dark got nothing to do with the eyes of God. He can see you just as good in the dark as he can in the light. You can't hide from God. I can't hide from God. There's no sneaky sneaky with God. Just throw that out there. I know there's times we like to be sneaky sneaky with God, but if somebody's doing something bad to you, you don't want God to not see you. You want to get right there, Jim Dandy on the spot. Or Johnny on the spot, as they say. Or Becky on the spot, whatever. But Jesus is going to take his vengeance upon the unsaved world at that time. Then Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3. He's going to cast him into the bottomless pit that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. Now that's a literal thousand years, not a figurative thousand years. And it's on the earth. It's not in the heavens as the nonmillennialist would tell you. It's not up in the sky somewhere. The kingdom of Christ is going to be on the earth. Though Christ is to reign in our hearts in a spiritual realm, He's actually going to have a real, literal, 
figurative, I mean literal kingdom on the face of the earth. Twelve nations, the twelve tribes of Israel are going to have that land divided up for them, all the way from the top of the land all the way to the bottom. And that little spit of land that they possess presently is not to be compared to the land that God promised Father Abraham. The twelve tribes will take that over. But anyway, those are the remnant who are living during that time. And they will have their ancestors to help guide them because also at the same time, that is also when God is going to raise the Old Testament saints in their resurrection. You see, Old Testament believers do not get resurrected until after New Testament believers are resurrected with their bodies in its glorified form. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Somebody's already saying right now, John, send me the copy of that thing. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Be glad to do it. I'm going to take but a second to do it. Daniel 12. Daniel, you know, is a prophecy of the uh, judgment that God had on Israel as we read about lamentations. We did several studies on lamentations. And Daniel was one of those fellows that got captured by Nebuchadnezzar and taken to Babylon. Okay? Way east of Jerusalem. Okay? And God gives a prophecy through him. And one of the prophecies that he gives through him is how demons work through governments to get satanic control over people and populations. Hello. We talked about that. The prince of Persia, that was a demon. Talked about that in chapter 10. The prince of Persia. And then in chapter 10, Verse, that's chapter 10, verse 13. In chapter 10, uh, verse 20, there's the prince of Greece. These are demonic powers that Satan sends to have influence in national governments so that they can influence things that suppress the glory of God among the citizens. That would be suppressing the teaching and the preaching of the Bible, and the morals and the truths that the Bible teaches. That's what Satan works through powers and principalities to gather control over a massive group of people, is to use demonic forces to influence. They are whisperers, as one of the types of demons is those that are whispering demons, who bug into the ear ideas and to the dreams ideas, of politicians who come up with the cray-cray ideas that you as a normal, good, decent human being, per se, even a Christian, would think a human being should not be capable of having such a policy. Demons are behind that. And these demons work in concert with the old sin nature of people to find humanity's worst ways of gathering and garnering and controlling the power over people. So there is a battle against powers and principalities. We we battle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's one way that it's being carried out against us. But in Daniel chapter 12, it also gives a little thing here talking about the fact that the Old Testament believers, Adam, Eve, Jacob, David, Solomon, Sarah, all the women, all the men, all those who believed in the Lord in the Old Testament, all the prophets and such and so forth and so on, they will get raised in their time. Verse 1, And and at that time shall Michael stand up. He's the warrior angel. Gabriel is the announcing angel. This is an archangel of God having two set of wings. This is Michael the archangel standing up, the great prince uh, who standeth for the children of thy people. That's Israel. He's their warring angel. There shall be a time of trouble. That's the tribulation period such as never has since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Everyone shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This is this is the body now. This is at the second coming of Christ. And they shall and then there will be some to everlasting life. That is those who have believed. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. That is those who have rejected. See, they, they had to wait on the resurrection of Christ before they ever had an op- option. 
Now their soul, if you're a believer, as an Old Testament saint, is in heaven, has been since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they haven't, they will not get a bodily resurrection until we get ours, seven years later than ours, because the people who are in the tribulation period are actually a part of Old Testament Israel. That is part, the end of the dispensation. That dispensation didn't end with the law. It was paused. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book unto the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. But look at verse 11. And from that time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. That's the middle of the tribulation period that the Antichrist is going to do in the middle of the tribulation. And the abomination that maketh desolate set up, that's his image in the temple. There shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. That's exactly three and a half years. Why in the world would God give exactly how many days there is to a period if it wasn't a literal period? So we need to believe the Bible. Not only looking back and looking now, but looking forward. From that time the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate shall set up and there be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed he that waits and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty five days. That's thirteen hundred and thirty five days. Because there were seventy five days at it. Remember for the cleanup. They're not going to be raised until after the cleanup and the burial of all those that we read about in Ezekiel chapter thirty nine verses twelve through seventeen. That's why those extra days were added on to that. But go to thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, when those Old Testament saints will be raised to receive their glorified bodies and rewards, and they will co-reign with living Jewish people on the earth who came out of the tribulation period, who believed on the Lord. They will co-reign with them through that thousand-year reign of Christ. And the bride of Christ, the church will have a private relationship in the government of Jesus Christ behind the scenes. And though some of us may go out as ambassadors around in Gentile nations, places of the world, there is a lot that you are going to do for that thousand years when in your glorified body. Representing Jesus Christ as an ambassador all over the world and all over the world during that time. And when the end of that time is up, then... Satan will be loosed for a short season. He will deceive the nations because you have to believe to be saved during that thousand year stretch. And again, you may live to be 900 and some years of age during that stretch because there will be longevity of life also as a part of that different era. I know that sounds wild and insane, but a child is also said to be able to sit down and and pet an adder at the time. The lion will lay down with the lamb at that time as well. Because God's going to remove the curse from the animal kingdom during that time. We've taught all of this. Lord, 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 we've taught this. And you know this. But there are a lot of people who have no idea that all this is still ahead. Because they've got their heads in the sand and they're scared to death about a little virus. Yes, we wear our mask. Because we understand that it's important not to spread it. We understand it. We respect that. But we don't care about all the conspiracy theories because there's a bunch of bunk going on all the time. And some of it may be true. But that's not what our interest is. There is so much in the Bible that people need to be listening, be learning. And the more you learn about the Bible, the greater hope you have for the future. And you stop letting the pettinesses of this world be more important than you get in the edification in the Word of God. This is your future. If you are a born-again child of God, this is your future. Not Wall Street, though you may have money in that. Not your career, though it may be wonderful and you may get reward from God for that. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And boy, when you get this in your spirit, everything else, is, you take it or leave it. Bother you none. We know why the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing. Because they've tried their best to cut the cords from themselves to God. That's not going to stop. And you are dead and gone or the rapture happens first. It's still going to go on. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that the people are going to try to hide from all this wrath. And they was, it says there will be no place for them to hide. And it also says there will be people who will be trying to die and they will not be able to die from it. 
I didn't get finished, but I better stop. I never get to some of the main stuff I wanted to cover. There's more to go. Maybe we'll get this the next time because there's some other stuff in here we really need to understand, but it's getting late. And as we say out in the country, I'm getting tarred. So at Forrest Gump said, I think I'll just go home. He's getting, shh, they say, oh, he's getting ready to say something great. He's getting ready to go back after running for two and a half years or so. Uh, he's got a long beard, the old raincoat on. He's worn out. You know, they run across the country about three times, and everybody stops all of a sudden. Oh, he's going to, because people start following him, you know, and he gets back there and he says, and they're, oh, he's going to say something important. He's getting, he's going to say something big, and he, and they say, well, what is it? He says, I think I'm going home. I'm tired. <laughs> We'll be all right. We'll be all right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessings in life and for your kindness to us. We thank you for your divine plan that you have that we are privileged to be a part of. We thank you that by our faith in Jesus Christ that our world is not limited by money or the sensations of the flesh or of the sensations of the thought life, but by the fellowship that we have with you in the Spirit. We thank you for reviving and bringing back to life our dead human spirit when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit took up residence right there and then. Speaks to us, encourages us through your word and through your will. Corrects us when we're wrong. Chastens us when we need to be chastened. And then lifts us up when we get down in the mouth and we get to feeling bad. We thank you that you are constantly there with us. Thank you that you love us. Help us to share that love with other people, to have mercy upon others, and to keep the faith. Oh, Father, to help us to understand to keep the faith, that we don't let little people get in our way, our government or anyone else get in our way of doing your divine will. Help us to learn to do what you'd have us to do. Help us to have the wisdom to do what we don't always feel comfortable with, but we look at the things of life and we see the bigger picture. Help us to not get petty, but to see the bigger picture and to honor you as your ambassadors, first and foremost, showing your virtue love to others. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and give thanks. Amen.